back at WNST, Towson, Baltimore. At Baltimore Positive, we are positively celebrating 25 years of this madness here at this point and celebrating with our 25 stories of glory. This week, it is uh, number 25, our famous signs that uh, we took out to Memorial Stadium, then downtown, the clobber Cleveland and spank the Yanks. Got to come up with something for the Mariners or the Astros or the Rangers or whomever it's going to be on the baseball side. Certainly this week, I don't know that we would need signs for the Houston Texans uh, at this point. Um, maybe a barn show this week and a couple of beers with the goose uh, would get this thing going. But I am going to have Dan Pastorini on this week. Uh, I, I've had John McClain on this week, the great Great Nils Lofgren will be joining us here at Baltimore Positive, and so is Luke Jones, who will be in Owings Mills as our sole representative. Uh, I am writing letters to Steve Bishotti, to John Harbaugh, to Eric DaCosta, and Sasha Brown to start the year. Luke, I'm surprised their ears weren't burning over Labor Day weekend. I, I know it's a little bit of a downtime, a couple days off, a last sort of gas before it gets going. Uh, you'll be out there all week as they get into the ebb and the flow. And sort of the thing I, I get at this, and it's the f you know first time in 27 years that I haven't had a plan to travel. Last year I had flights everywhere, thought I was going everywhere until Chad Steele decided to fire me as a legitimate media member. Um, but these one o'clock games, when you look at this and you see September and October, one o'clock, one o'clock, one o'clock, you know, it, it sets a tone for them to – get on schedule, to get guys back, to keep guys healthy, to know when you're playing. This is the normal body clock. And they really have the JV this week. I mean, John McClain said to me, there's no chance the Texans can beat the Ravens. So uh, you can listen to that one too. Yeah, I mean, it's go time, right? I mean, we've spent so much time, and, and this is the case every year with, with the NFL. It's not like baseball where we're talking about a game every night or a game just about every night or – two series every week. I mean, it's, we've talked about this and we've circled this date on the calendar since the schedule came out in May and so much talk, so many expectations, so much optimism. They went through the, the, the preseason Marlon Humphrey's the only injury of note. And even that's only going to be a couple weeks. You know, he's, he's not going to be out all season. They're healthy. I think they're feeling good. Although everyone loves their team this time of year. I, other than maybe the Texans, right? <laughs> uh, but, hey, they have a new head coach, rookie quarterback, you know, uh, an accomplished quarterback uh, coming out of Ohio State and C.J. Stroud. And there's always that unknown element when you're talking about a new coaching staff. So not that I'm saying that, thinking that the Ravens need to be on upset alert this week because they're clearly the more talented team. They're the superior team, as they should be. You know, when, when you're talking ten about... 10 points feels like a gift on the on the gambling side, right? Like, ten, 10 points feels like they should win by 21. And I don't... You know, we watch college football this weekend, and some games are a little more... A little different than you think when the NIL money starts floating into Baton Rouge and uh, and, and into into a Tallahassee. And, um, but in this particular case, like, there's nothing to recommend the Texans here and everything to love the Ravens, right? Yeah, I mean, it's just other than the unknown of new coaching staff and new quarterback and lots of other new players, you're right. I mean, you, you look at this, this is the kind of game the Ravens should go out there and handle their business, and they should win, and they should win going away. Although, as you pointed out, college football, Colorado, Deion Sanders, and, and look what happened there against the, the national championship runner-up in TCU. So you never really know, but there's so much excitement about this team. There's so much optimism. Uh, even their, you know, even with their questions on the defensive side of the ball right now, even just, you know, wherever you fall in this offense, I think there's excitement, but there's there's the unknown until you go out and see it uh, for the first time and see Odell Beckham in, in a live game setting and see Zay Flowers in a live game setting and see this Todd Munkin revamped Ravens offense in a live game setting. There is some unpredictability uh, about it, but there's a lot of excitement. And if you're the Ravens, you've had a fairly inconsequential preseason. I even noted in my uh, 12 Ravens thoughts late last week at BaltimorePositive.com, other than Jadavion Clowney and Ronald Darby, you look at the 53-man roster after the dust settled, it's what you would have expected uh, in late July. It's what you would have expected uh, in June. Uh, so from that standpoint, it's not as though anything earth-shattering happened over the last six weeks, but it's time to go play some football and play it for real. And it's great to hear 
uh, about team chemistry and, and all these different things that we've heard about over the last couple of weeks and how much these guys love each other. And that's great. You know, that I'm not saying that that's a bad thing, but ultimately now we're going to have something tangible to talk about. We're going to have a real football game to talk about and whether it's a three touchdown win, whether it's a six point win or whether the unthinkable happens, it'll be something real to talk about. And uh, for me, uh, as you're at, you know, as I'm back there on the, on the backfields and Owings mills and you know, the monotony of it gets to you uh, after a little while, you keep talking about the same things over and over and over. It's going to be nice to, to see this team in the flesh. Didn't even get any semblance of a preview uh, in these preseason games. So, you know, at least you got a cameo uh, in past years, but we know how that's gone the last couple of years. So it's time to kick it off for real. And, I don't think we're going to learn a ton on Sunday necessarily about this football team but because of what you said. It, it, I think it's we're going to learn what the offense, offense is. See, I think I'm going to learn a ton. I, I think I, I haven't. Why? I, I think I'm going to see what they're trying to do against a bad team offensively where the mindset is, at least for the first game, to come out and say, Lamar's going to throw it left. Lamar's going to throw it right. Dobbins is going to run. They're going to run Lamar less in a game like this. I mean, Lamar should run the ball four or five, six times this week. Like, that's where it should be. They have other weapons now. His weapon is yeah. supposed to be the threat of him running and the sword of him passing. I want to see that. I haven't seen that. Well, you have seen it at times, though, because you can go back to the Miami Dolphins opener in 2019 where Lamar had a perfect passer rating and threw five touchdowns. So Let's see that this point... week. I, I And I, I would love to see that. He's capable sure, but, of that. But the – of course he's capable of that. He led the NFL in touchdown passes four years ago. But I guess the point I was trying to make is it's going to be one data point. You know, we're finally going to have a data point. We, what did we see in the preseason that we can probably take some, you know, draw some early conclusions, some preliminary conclusions, way more 11 personnel. And we've been talking about that since the spring. Clearly the investment they made at wide receiver, you're not going to see this team lining up in 22 personnel and 12 personnel all the time. Uh, it's going to be much more uh, three wide receiver sets. Now, mind you, that doesn't mean that they're not going to run the ball, but they're going to run the ball more spread out. You know, you're, you're going to see that. And that's honestly something I would have liked to have seen uh, the last couple of years, you know, with, with J.K. Dobbins back there and, you know, a, a lighter box uh, that, that you're facing up front and makes things easier for your offensive linemen, make things easier for Lamar Jackson and, and you know, you could see the Red Sea part, so to speak, on occasion where he might take off still. Uh, so, so you're going to see that. I'm, I'm intrigued to see what Patrick Ricard's role in this offense is going to look like. I don't think it's going to be him lining up at fullback nearly as much. I think you're going to see him lining up as a blocking tight end, which, by the way, going back to the Nick Boyle injury a few years ago, we had seen more and more of Patrick Ricard as a blocking tight end anyway. So it's not as though he hasn't done that, but I think it's going to be more pronounced because... I don't think they're going to be lining up with a fullback all that often anymore. I think you're going to see that third and one, fourth and one kind of deal. But other than that, I certainly don't think we're going to see that on first down. I think we're going to see more passing on first down, which is an analytics minded uh, approach uh, of how you do that. I mean, even the Philadelphia Eagles, who had a very good running game last year and have a good running game, they run, they throw the ball a lot on first down. You know, that's kind of an analytics way of doing it. Throw on first down, run on second and short. You know, kind of the the backwards way of of how things were always done. But analytically speaking, it, it bears out that works. You know, that that's an efficient way of running an offense. So we're not going to be able to draw these. You know, people will draw big time conclusions from week one. Of course we will. Uh, that's what we do. That, right. But and you'll ride that horse for six six and a half days. Yeah, and then you'll <laughs> see something totally different the following week because it's so matchup driven. But I guess the point is we're finally going to have our curiosity start to be satisfied here. But what I'm trying to emphasize is don't fall in love with, or, or just make a, these wide sweeping conclusions based on just what we see in week one, because part of it is, yeah, I don't think the Houston Texans are going to be very good. So that'll be part of it, but it is going to be nice to see this in the flesh. I've, I've talked about this a lot. Other others who've been out there in Owings Mills have talked about this a lot. Odell Beckham looked really good this summer. Uh, and to his credit, he practiced just about every day. I thought he would be, I don't know, a Ronnie Stanley kind of practice schedule uh, this summer where he'd practice one day, then have the next day off, and then maybe two days on and one off. He practiced just about every day. Now, they manage his reps. He's not leading them in reps at the wide receiver position, but he looked good. Zay Flowers looks very promising. 
<laughs> I mean, go down the list. The guy, guys look good, but it's practice. Now we get to see it in a live game setting, which is not the same thing. And that's not a knock on anything they did over the summer. It's just we know how this works. Practice is practice. You're preparing for the season. Every single day you're out there at practice, Todd Munkin is learning about these guys. He's learning what they do best and what personnel groupings are going to work best and what play calls are going to work best. And on the flip side, he also learned what they they don't do quite as well. And they're not going to broadcast that, but things that maybe I saw out on the practice field and other reporters saw out on the practice field or fans who had a chance to attend training camp uh, in August, things that they were working on then, you may never see that again or may not see it until week 13. You know, that's just how this works. So it's just, it's good to get to a point now where, hey, there's optimism, there's excitement, there should be. You know, I, I think this is going to be a good football team. Now we'll, we'll see how good uh, moving forward, but we finally get to see some live game action, see what they're really good at, see if the pass rush is as big of a concern as some believe it to be, see it, what they are what they look like at corner without Marlon Humphrey at least these first couple weeks. And again, all this hype uh, about this offense, they're healthy. You know, Mark, Mark Andrews is the only guy that's been banged up recently, but he's, he's going to practice this week. John Harbaugh has been adamant about saying he's fine, you know, and I'll take John at his word for right now on that because he's been so over the top adamant about him being fine rather than being vague as he can be about you know other injuries in the past. But it's all sitting right there for this offense now. There's There are no more excuses. Greg Roman's gone. They actually have wide receivers. They have multiple wide receivers. Uh, Eric DaCosta joked about it late last week that for the first time that he could ever remember, they got calls about a couple teams being interested in a wide receiver. Uh, you know what, and wh- whoever it was, Duvernay, wh- whatever it might have been, the point is they're in a bit better position. There, Greg Roman's no longer th- the whipping boy, so to speak. You know, everyone w- wanted to put every problem on him, and you know there were other things that worked against them. They're healthy though, and, and everything's in place. They have solid to good depth at every position on, on that offense, other than maybe quarterback, because if Lamar Jackson's Injured again, they're going nowhere, you know, and that's the case for any team with a franchise quarterback. Let's be clear. But other than that, you know, this team on paper looks like they should be a, an explosive, productive, really exciting offense to watch. And on defense, yeah, there are some questions about corner right now, especially with Humphrey out and the pass rush. And we've been talking about that for a few years now, you know, uh, so we're going to see how this plays out. And I think not fortunately, you know, because I, I'm not saying that to be a knock on them, but when you do get the JV, as, as you described it in week one, it is kind of a nice way to ease into it, especially when your starters haven't played in the preseason. Better not hiccup this week. Luke's going to be out in Owings Mills all week long. We will be monitoring all things Ravens uh, out on our social media. Uh, I've had John McClain on this week. The great, great Dante Pastorini will talk some Oilers history uh, with me. Uh, one of my first uh, football heroes on the program this week, as well as Nils Lofgren. Uh, everybody's hero playing this joint behind me at the Camden Yards this week as uh, Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band uh, makes their way back to Baltimore. So we got you covered a lot of ways this week. All right, so for football and our friends at Hollywood Casino, uh, we're going to be making picks this week with uh, Christian up there. So I got things I'm going to be doing here that are going to start the season the right way. Um, but I talked to Coach Billick last week. By the way, he sends his best from Minnesota. Um and we were talking football and just life and just catching up and grandkids, you know, all that stuff. But it reminds me this time of year when I look down, I'm like, all right, they got the JV this week. Who they got next week? Oh, Cincinnati. All right, who do they have? To- Colts, well, you don't think much of them at this point. Uh, a little homecoming there. And then, and then Cleveland, hmm, maybe. And then Pittsburgh, hmm, maybe. I don't know. Where are you on the quartile? You know, uh, Billick would always say, let's take these four at a time. You know, where, where are you in this first month? How do you really feel about the Browns? How do you really feel about the Steelers? How do you really feel about the Bengals, Burrow? And, you know, they haven't had a quarterback during training camp. So it's been a little bit different. You mentioned full health or good health or Marlon Humphrey or teams missing players or where the Aaron Rodgers machine might be up with the Jets. It's a coming out party for everybody in the league. But we talk Padres and Mets and Orioles, you know, the surprising teams in baseball. Where are you on the Ravens? Where, where, how do you really feel about their first month? 
I mean, I, I think you look at the first month. I mean, rookie quarterback, week one, C.J. Stroud. I mean, I think Demeco Ryan's is a. I think he's an intriguing head coach. I mean, he's coming from a what's been a successful team in San Francisco for several years now. So they might be on the right track. Do I think that right track is going to lead to a week one win <laughs> where they pull off an upset against the Ravens? Of course not. And I'll have my official prediction later this week, but I think you know where I'm I going. I tried to one. get it out of you, but I, you I, know, I, think, I know which way you're leading. Yeah, yeah. But I, I think I think this matchup against Cincinnati in week two is interesting just from the standpoint of, look, I'll, and you know, Cleveland's talented, but they're the Browns, right? And And, and I still – don't know where Deshaun Watson is as a quarterback at, at this point in time. You know, not even getting into off field or how anyone feels about him personally. You know, he didn't look very good when he played late last year. The Browns were better with Jacoby Brissett at, at quarterback earlier in the season. Now, by the way, they got each other gonna, while we're, we're playing, right? So we're going to figure one side or the other out while we're watching the Ravens Sunday. Yeah, and we'll, we'll do the overreaction one way or the other. But yeah, we'll, we'll get to see what that looks like. I, I think Pittsburgh's interesting. You know, as far as this division, I mean, there are a lot of hype on the Steelers that wasn't there. And there you go. Is too much being put into how Kenny Pickett and how they looked over the preseason. But, you know, but going back to what you said, this first quarter of the season, I don't think anyone's overly concerned about Houston in week one. I mean, let's just call a spade a spade there. At Cincinnati, a couple things. As you mentioned, Joe Burrow missed the entire preseason. Now, he he has been back practicing and. You know, it's not as though he's only going to get one or two practices and then he's going to be out there. So physically, I would expect he's fine, but he did miss a lot of reps and, and that offense missed a lot of reps. So does that mean we're going to see a Bengals offense that's firing on all cylinders with the way that they're capable of doing that? I, I think maybe not. And that might be something that helps the Ravens as you're looking at the Ravens defense and saying, ooh, probably no Marlon Humphrey and, and even Humphrey at his best has had his, his issues covering Jamar Chase on occasion. So, you know, but it's a division game on the road. The Bengals uh, are, have been the team to beat in the AFC North the last couple of years. They, they will be until the Ravens or someone else knocks them off. So, you know, that game you don't feel as good about, but home against Indy, another rookie quarterback, Anthony Richardson. Interesting to see what their offense looks like. Could it be uh, another version of, Lamar Jackson, Greg Roman, early era. Yep. We'll see. You know, I, I think they're intriguing, but do I think Indianapolis is going to be very good this year? No. And, and uh, of course, that game's being played in Baltimore. So, you know, you, those three games, you know, I, I look at the Ravens being two and one, you know, not to say they can't win in Cincinnati, but uh, I'll give the Bengals the home field advantage nod. And then at Cleveland, I think you feel pretty good about the Ravens' chances going there. That, that, and, I wonder I what, what they're going to be when we get there. You know, yeah. I love that trip every year because, you know, I like yeah. going to Tremont and getting breakfast and whatnot. But, you know, we're going to be turning the corner on the, the Orioles going into the playoffs at that point, maybe with a bye if this thing can hold mm -hmm. up. You know, I look at the Browns, man. Dude, the, the Browns, they, they open with Cincinnati. Then then they play Pittsburgh on Monday night next week after the Kicks concert, mm -hmm. week two. Uh, and then they got the Titans at home. Oh, and three, one and two, two and one. I, I don't know. I don't know what they are, but I think we're going to we're going to know more about them then, because if they win any of these games, they beat the Bengals, they beat the Steelers or they beat the Titans. You'd have to say, well, that's that's something If they beat any or all of them. I mean, they, they have kind of an interesting we're going to know what they are by week three. I don't know if we're going to know what the Ravens are. To your point, we're playing these stiffs, the JV, you know, like I, I, I won't know what this is. From the Ravens, I will know what the offense is and what, but I expect the Ravens to be three and one. I mean, I I really do. Yeah. I mean, looking through this, and if they lose to the Bengals, okay. I mean, I, you and I maybe expect that, but if they beat the Bengals, now all of a sudden you're talking about something different. You're talking about that Steelers game in Week Five as, you know, if they're four and zero oh at that point, really, if they're that good, then you're talking about all that promise, and then mm -hmm. the purple. 10 starts going here and the Orioles have expectations. We get a different kind of season here where we're going to have this orange purple thing because the Orioles could go out with a bang, boom, 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 be gone the first weekend of October. Cause that's the way this works. Um, sure. I don't think it's going to go that way because I have more confidence in them. But as this thing builds in, I really expect the Ravens to be good. I mean, and not necessarily good that they're going to win the Super Bowl, but good here in September in that, Head coach, players, motivated, healthy, bad schedule, 
one o'clock games, things stay on schedule for them. It would not shock me to see them be five and zero, go going to London. Yeah. Like I like that wouldn't, I I wouldn't be like, oh, they can't do that. Now, dude, they start stubbing their toe and things don't go well here. Somebody gets hurt, something bad happens, that changes it. But they they should be four and one going to London. Yeah, I, I mean the only thing I would caution is. You're talking about three division road games over that time. And as much as I think you're on the same wavelength as me at looking at, you know, I think it's Cincinnati and Baltimore. I don't think Pittsburgh's going to be bad. I don't even think the Browns are going to be terrible or anything like that. I think this is going to be a competitive division. And while I think the Bengals and the Ravens are the teams really duking it out for the division title, that's not to say that you're going to go to Pittsburgh or going to go to Cleveland and it's going to be a cakewalk. I mean, I, I think this could easily be one of those years where, even the Bengals and the Ravens are three and three in the division. You know, that that's, you know, we, we know how this plays out, right? I mean, it, it happens well, in your so often scenario. If they're going to lose, they're going to lose on the road. They play them all on the road. So well, in and that's scenario, my scenario. They should lose two out of three, maybe. Right. Well, I, I guess that's my point in saying I would be a little surprised if they're five and oh, and if, if they are five and oh, then yeah, you're talking about this team having the potential to, you know, you're going to be in contention maybe then for the number one seed. You know what? Well, that's I will where you want to be. They haven't played an AFC championship game in 27 sure. years. So, like, sure, I, sure, I'm but... not – this is supposed to be loaded for bear. They're supposed to be the best team in the division. Now, you know, forget Buffalo and the Jets and whatever the kid in San Diego is now doing in L.A., you know, like the, the other – Mahomes. So, uh, you don't have to deal with any of them. But they are going to have to deal with some West Coast games. I mean, they're going to be making some trips. They're going to be doing some traveling. Yeah. And they better make their due in Cincinnati, Cleveland, and Pittsburgh because none of the other road trips are easy. It's not just get on and go beat the Jets and beat a 40-year-old version of Flacco. I don't think they're going to get that. I think these road games, they're going to be given hell. They better, they better build some padding. They better not be 2-3 and three or 3-2. Three and two. That's what I'm saying because they're going to – Sure. They're going to yeah. scuffle going out to San Francisco and out to L.A. in the middle of the night, even out to the desert, I think. I mean, they have tough trips. They they do have some tough trips. There's no question. I, I think just in general, you look at the second half of the schedule, although I might beg to differ on the Arizona game. I, I think the Cardinals are going to be awful. And, and okay. I think part of I think part of that's by design. I think they're going to be they're looking at at the top picks in next year's draft. And th this you know new regime is not enamored with Kyler Murray that we'll get to that in, in late October when they play. Uh, but you look at the first half of the schedule. Yeah. I mean, you look at this. Even though you do have three division road games, you want to get off to a good start because even look in October, uh, I mean, you get beyond these first three games where you know Houston at Cincinnati, Indianapolis. Let's just say for argument's sake, two and one. You know, they lose to the Bengals. No shame in that if that happens, of course. Uh, but at Cleveland, at Pittsburgh, at Tennessee, home against Detroit coming back from London. We saw how that worked out against the Steelers back in 2017 after the Jacksonville game. Uh, and Detroit's you know, they, they gonna be their... good. I, I, I'm, I'm, yeah. a, I'm, a, so, I'm a believer in Detroit as being right, right. being competitive. So, so as much as you look at that schedule and just in a vacuum, you don't you look at those opponents. It's not like it's this juggernaut hardest schedule in the NFL, but you do have three straight road games there and two of them are division games. And then you do have Detroit, and we're gonna we're gonna see Detroit this week and. You know, be a good litmus test for them against the the Chiefs. You know, not, see where they are going up against the defending Super Bowl champions. But you know, I, I think October has the has the chance to be you know, a little sneaky, challenging for the Ravens. Not even sneaky; it's challenging. Anytime you have three straight road games, and I get it. The Titans, I don't think the Titans are nearly as good uh, as they've been uh, here in recent years, and they collapsed the second half of last year. We saw that, but it's a London game, and we all know what happened. Six years ago when the Ravens went to London uh, against the Jacksonville team that, in fairness, actually turned out to be pretty, pretty darn good that year. But they still got destroyed in that game. So, you know, that's always a challenge. So th this it, it's important for the Ravens to get off to a good start here. There's no They're doubt about lose that. some games this year. Now that I'm looking at the schedule, they're going to lose some games. I mean, and look, I, I'll, I'll, I'll continue to go back to 2019 when they were 14 and two. This you know best point differential the NFL had seen since the 07 Patriots, right? The undefeated Patriots until the Super Bowl. You know, it, it comes down to it. This team's all about January anyway at this point, right? Is there anything they could do in the regular season at this point that's not going to have someone saying, yeah, but what about January? What about Lamar winning in January? What about Mark Andrews winning in January? What about Marlon Humphrey winning in January? What about John Harbaugh at this point, who's now, as you pointed out a little bit earlier, 
now more than a decade removed from the last time he was in an AFC championship game. It's all about January for this team. So my point with that is, yeah, let's be clear. You have to play well enough to get there. But, you know, how much is the number one seed worth? How much is home field advantage worth? You know, the Ravens have done some of their best work in January being road dogs. So, I mean, it's, you know, we're going to see how it plays out. But everything about this team between now and what you hope, what you expect is getting to January is how do you put yourself in a position continuing to get better offensively, doing enough defensively, you know, uh, figuring out some semblance of a pass rush, making sure you're, you've got enough depth at corner, this passing game, taking the next step, you know, reaching a higher ceiling than it ever had under Greg Roman, everything about this season. Yeah. You, you need to win. You need to win games. You have to qualify. Let's be clear about that. Let's not put, you know, the heart or, or the cart before the horse, but, at the same time, just getting there, that's not good enough anymore for this group, for this, you know, for this current era of Ravens football. And Lamar Jackson and those guys would be the first to tell you that. It's time for them to step up, but they've got to show the improvement along the way and continuing to get better and doing what you need to do to put themselves in position that once January does come, that they're ready to go. And health is a big part of that, beginning with number eight, staying on the field. There's no question about that. He's Luke Jones. Uh, he will be on the backfields in uh, Owings Mills talking all things football all week long. He'll be on with Dennis at four or uh, 3 o'clock to 5 o'clock on the Sunday Sports Voice. We have so many things going on. Uh, it's football season. We're doing the Maryland Crab Cake Tour next Friday, the 15th at Fadley's. A little bit of a down week, man. We had Labor Day. It's 150 degrees this week. It's crazy. Springsteen's in town. We got Nils Lofgren on the air here this week, as well as this big game with the Houston Texans. Uh, you hear from John McClain. You hear from Dante Pastorini, as well as Anne Arundel County Executive uh, Stuart Pittman. We are celebrating 25 years uh, with our special Purple Cupcake here. Uh, we're going to be doing a little pregame tailgating next week as the, the Tampa Rays come to town with some big baseball games as well. Hollywood Casinos, we're doing a big event on the 15th. That's the morning that the Ravens are in Tottenham. Uh, we're going to be having a proper British breakfast uh, up in uh, Perryville at the Hollywood Casino and, uh, and the ESPN Casino that they're going to be having up there as well. So lots of things going on around here. Um, Luke, just on the bullish nature of all of this, and we've talked about this a little bit, the thing that I'm most interested in with the, with the football team is what the offense is going to do and running versus passing and what their will and their want and what they've been practicing and how that's going to convey to the field, not this week, but for this first quartile of games. Like, how is this offense going to look? Are we going to look at it and say they're averaging 28 points a game? Are we looking at it and say, oh, they've been kicking the ball around? Are we looking at it and saying, ah, Tucker's kicked three field goals every week and they're kind of sputtering and they're only scoring 24 points and I should say only 24. I, I don't know what the defense is going to be, but – we're we have an expectation here at a at a at a blank screen of all of these wide receivers, all of these Twitter nuts and these Raven heads think they're going to throw the ball 58 times because they've got all these guys catching 15 balls a week, and that's just not that's not reality. I don't know no. what reality is, and I wouldn't even throw a dart, but I could start to look at it and say, all right, they're going to win 34 to 13 this week. I've said that a hundred times. You know, they're going to rack up. You know. 480 yards of offense this week. They're going to play hasty football. They're going to run the ball a little bit more. Maybe you think they are. What does it look like? Dobbins, 18 carries, 114 yards. Uh, Beckham, four catches, 56 yards and a touchdown. Flowers, six catches, 84 yards. Uh, Andrews, six catches, 123 yards and a touchdown. I, I don't like. That's what it feels. It doesn't feel like there's going to be anything gaudy. It doesn't feel like Lamar's going to throw for 480 yards. It feels like Lamar's going to throw for 269 yards and hopefully be 23 or 31. I, I, you know, like, and I hope I come back a week from now and these are all the positive yeah. good news because that's the way this is going to have to look. There's going to have to be some kind of balance because it's not going to be pinball Madden football. It's not, I don't, I don't think they're going to rack up 53 points this week. I don't think they're going to play like that. I don't think they're going to be big strike in that way. Yeah. I mean, it, look, it, it's week one there, there. There's always going to be, there's always an unpredictable nature uh, to, to what happens. You know, I mean, someone could get hurt in the first quarter. That's pivotal to your game plan. I mean, you, you never really know what's going to happen on that front. But uh, as I said, 
I think we're definitely going to see way more three wide receiver sets, whether that's throwing from 11 personnel or running from 11 personnel. I think you're just, that's going to become their new identity. Whereas the last couple of years, you know, it was way more 22 personnel, two, two backs, two tight ends, or one back, two tight ends. Uh, you know, we, we saw so much of that under Greg Roman that I think you're not going to see those looks nearly as often. I think you are going to see more throwing on first down. That And mind mind you, that does not mean if you throw on first down that that, that doesn't equate to necessarily throwing it 48 times a game either. Uh, they're going to throw it more than they have in the past or in general. I, I don't think there's any question about that. You don't invest at the wide receiver position the way that they do without intentions of throwing the ball more than they did in the past. But I still do think, and I'll continue to say, you still have J.K. Dobbins. You still have Gus Edwards. Justice Hill, look for him, Nestor. I would not be shocked to see Justice Hill more involved in this offense than we've ever seen because I do think he's a good fit for the kind of back that Todd Munkin wants to see. This is an offensive line that's still very much designed to run block. That's not to say they're not good pass protectors, but any offensive line, they love to run block. You know, they love to get out there and row great and uh, and blow guys off the ball and and win the the line of scrimmage. I mean, that's that's what they want to do. So, and and I'll continue to remind everyone, Todd Munkin at Georgia. What were the Bulldogs known for having won back-to-back national championships? Running game featuring the tight ends. Hmm, that still sounds familiar to how the Ravens used to play under Greg Roman. So, I'm not saying that's going to just continue, but my point is those those aspects of an offense are not going to disappear from this offense until we we see otherwise, Nestor. The Ravens' number one receiver is still Mark Andrews until we see otherwise, until we see Lamar's going to Beckham or Zay Flowers or Rashad Bateman or whoever that much more than he has in the past. Uh, in the case of Bateman, obviously Flowers and Beckham are new, but you still have an all-pro tight end. And I don't, I don't think we should overlook that. We shouldn't overlook the fact that Todd Munkin very much valued the running game at Georgia. And, oh, yeah, this team can r- still run the ball really well, right? I mean, they, sh- or they better. You know, they should, you know, because the personnel-wise, it's not terribly different from where Greg Roman, you know, from when Greg Roman was here, O-line-wise and running back-wise. So, you know, we're just going to have to see how it plays out. I, I still will say I think it's – Definitely more passing than in the past, but I don't think that means pass heavy. I don't think that means they're going away from being balanced. We are still talking about a John Harbaugh-led roster here. John Harbaugh likes to run the football. He's old school in that way. So, no, I don't think Lamar Jackson's going to be throwing it 45 times a game. There might be some games where that happens, but by the way, that happened in the past on occasion. So it's going to be dictated by the matchup, the game situation where they are health-wise, all of those things. But I think what's just going to be fun about this is, yeah, there there is some unknown. You know, Greg Roman's no longer here. You know, the, the guy that was the scapegoat for some things that weren't even his fault. You know, he's no longer in the picture, so there are no more excuses for the, everyone who's left behind. It's time to to make this offense the best possible version of itself. All right. Well, uh, Coach Hardball will have them ready. I hope everybody is reading uh, my dear Steve Bashotti letters. I have a really special letter for John Harbaugh uh, regarding truth and integrity, uh, especially in regard to journalism, uh, as well as Eric DaCosta, Sashi Brown. They'll all be getting postmarks from me this week. You can find all of it at Column Ness. Uh, you can find all of our work on social media. Luke's at Baltimore. Luke, out on Instagram, out on Twitter, uh, out on uh, Facebook. We have observations, insights on football, on baseball, and certainly on Bruce Springsteen and E Street Band with a long chat with Nils Lofgren this week. We talked about county government last week uh, with Stuart Pittman and our 25th anniversary with our longtime producer, Ray Bachman, one of my favorite people. We had a crab cake down at Pappas last week and told some old stories about signs, signs, everywhere a sign. Also, this week coming up, Number 24 is going to be the memory of our barn shows and our, our our purple live shows. And Luke, you were part of the last show we ever did with Sam Cook on a snowy night uh, up in uh, Greenmount Station. But a long, long legacy of 25 years before the plague, really, of uh, of doing shows. Ryan Jensen just showed up. Literally, I was surfing 
uh, building his house out in Colorado. Uh, so um, there's never a day I don't see Dan Wilcox. So many, many uh, relationships and friendships that I hope to stir up a little bit during the course of the season uh, with old barn folks that are still with us. Uh, and I'll be putting a bunch of pictures up. Uh, it's always good to see. I, I gave Rod Woodson some love on uh, on social media two weeks ago. Who doesn't deserve love more than Rod Woodson? the great Hall of Famer. So I'll miss his calls as well. So it is football season. Buckle up your chin strap. Get ready to read some stuff. Luke's going to be writing stuff. He's in Owings Mills. We're following Oriole baseball from the West Coast. Back here for some tailgating next weekend. I am uh, I'm thrilled that I have survived. My wife has survived. The rest of us, not Jimmy Buffett. All the rest of us have survived to get to the point where there's a September at WNST where the Orioles have a 35 over 500 advantage and a lead in the American League East and a chance to get a buy, a baseball buy. That <laughs> I feel like I'm in Back to the Future or something. Um, and 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 a real chance here to uh, to do something special in October. And we already have a special uh, September with pretty good football around here the rest of the month. I'm Nestor. He's Luke. We're WNST AM 1570, Towson, Baltimore. Come on down to Fadley's uh, and see us on the 15th as well. We'll be giving away some Maryland Lottery scratch-offs, some Raven scratch-offs as well as celebrating our relationship with Coppin State now in our 10th year of our flagship with the Mighty Eagles. Back for more on Baltimore Positive and WNST. We are Baltimore Positive and WNST AM 1570, Towson, Baltimore.